Good afternoon and welcome to South Pole's webinar, Mandatory Climate Reporting for Australian Companies, How to Get Ready. My name is Alex Staples and I'm a Business Development Manager with South Pole and I'll be your host for today. A few matters of housekeeping before we get going. All participants will be muted upon joining. However, questions are welcome at any time and can be submitted via the question box. We do have a Q&A session at the end uh, where we will try and answer as many questions as possible. This session is also being recorded and the recording will be shared with participants, which you can share internally following the completion of the webinar. Today, I am joined by my colleagues, Nancy Sher, Senior Managing Consultant within our Climate Risks and Opportunities team, and Sonia Sampson, Senior Manager within our Climate Strategies team. And we are all dialing in from Eora Nation, the land of the Gadigal people. A quick overview of what we're gonna to cover today. Nancy will begin by taking us through the regional landscape of mandatory reporting, focusing on APAC before zooming in to Australia. She will then give an introduction to the International Sustainability Standards Board, ISSB, which is set to become the new global gold standard for sustainability and climate reporting. Sonia will then take us through practical steps that businesses can take to prepare starting from today, as well as key takeaways, and we will round out with a Q&A. At this point, I will hand over to Nancy to take us through the regional landscape of mandatory reporting. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I'm very excited today to share some knowledge about the upcoming Australian disclosure requirements um, and more about climate risk disclosure requirements generally. But first, let's take a bit more of a global view before we zoom in. Um, what you see on the page here is that across the board, there is lots of global momentum towards mandating climate risk disclosure requirements. So on the screen there, is a screenshot from the latest TCFD report, which was just released last week. Um, to take a step back for those who are a little bit newer to the climate risk world, uh, the TCFD stands for the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures. And this is basically a voluntary framework that's been considered pretty much gold standard in the climate risk disclosure world in the past five years. And indeed many jurisdictions globally have, who have mandated climate risk disclosures have based it off the TCFD framework. So companies can sign up to be official TCFD supporters, um, which is what the numbers that you see on the screen here. Now, of course, being a TCFD report, a supporter doesn't necessarily translate into having high quality TCFD disclosures, but it is at least a strong signal and starting point uh, to show your public commitment and hopefully follow through on that. So on the left-hand side, uh, you'll see that the number of TCFD supporters have increased overall about five times in the past five years, and a roughly equal split between non-financial institutions and financial institutions. Um, globally, as of the report last week, we are looking at about 4,850 TCFD supporters globally, and uh, much of this growth from the past year has been coming from the Asia Pacific region. So there is a lot happening in our region. Um, most likely quite a few of uh, that is skewed by Japan, which has the highest number of TCEFD supporters worldwide. Um, there are many reasons why a company might sign up to be a TCFD supporters, um, including reputational benefits, uh, maybe stakeholder pressures. Uh, compliance is often a strong one, especially what we've seen from our clients. So especially today, we will focus on that compliance piece. If we can move on to the next slide, please. If we zoom in a little bit more into our Asia Pacific region, this is pretty much transition risk in action. There have been uh, lots of jurisdictions that have mandated climate risk disclosures. The leaders in our region are what you see on the page here. So Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, through to Australia and New Zealand. Some interesting differences when you look at it regionally like this is how these requirements are being introduced. So some of them, such as in Japan, Hong Kong and in Singapore, these have been pushed through stock exchanges. In Australia and New Zealand, these are being pushed through by the government. So what this means is that this can influence who the requirements might apply to, as well as the pace at which the compliance needs to happen. 
So typically uh, the stock exchanges can make it happen a lot quicker. Um, if you're pushing it through government, it might take a little longer just because of processes. Um, and then next slide, please. If we zoom in again in uh, further into Australia, Australian companies are about to undergo an important change to their annual and sustainability reporting. Um, so onto the next slide, a little bit of context about these requirements. Uh, it started in about late 2022. The then new government was looking to introduce requirements for companies to disclose its climate related information in line with the TCFD and um, what we'll look at in a bit, which is the ISSB standards um, embedded in their annual reports. So uh, the government has committed to this with the view of ensuring greater transparency and accountability when it comes to sharing climate related plans and its financial risks as well as opportunities. And this will help put Australia in more of a, a level playing field with the rest of the world who have already moved on to mandate these requirements. So in um, late 2022, they released a first draft and consultation paper, which ended in February this year. Then in June, they released a second round uh, of consultation paper, which was roughly around the time when uh, these ISSB standards were released. Um, and a quick note is that ISSB stands for the International Sustainability Standards Board and uh, is emerging as pretty much the, the new global standard. And so we'll unpack that a lot more in just a bit. Um, so where are we at now is um, the government still finalising the, the final uh, requirements after the second consultation. The legislative requirements set the big picture. So who does it apply to? When does it apply? Um, and alongside that, the AASB are the ones that have actually been tasked with developing the detailed disclosure standards. So these are currently being um, established and as of their board minutes last week, it did share that these are, um, the, for at least the draft have been finalised and they intend to publish those shortly, whenever that is. Uh, but when it is published, there will be a 120 day consultation period for people to provide feedback on and there should be three documents one for each of the ISSB's two standards. So um, they have what we call S1, which is the standard for sustainability generally, and then an S2, which is specifically for climate. So one for each of those, and then a third document will be more of a reference document. And then the standards are intended to also apply to both for-profit entities and not-for-profit entities. So let's keep our eyes peeled for the draft standards uh, when they are shared by the AASB. But the bottom line, is that for companies that fall within the scope of the proposed requirements, they need to be aware what they are expected to report on. And I think that's what most of us are here for today, um, when they will be phased in, uh, because they will be phased in over a three-year transitional period. So if we move on then to the question, who are the companies that fall within the scope of the requirements? Um, they are, there are three size criteria that are being considered. And um, each of these are relating to employee numbers, your consolidated gross assets at the end of your financial year, and your consolidated revenue. So if you meet two out of three of the criteria listed in each of these three groups, you would fall under that group. So it is over three years, starting with the, the larger entities and slowly expanding the scope of that to include um, medium and smaller entities. Um, I would also note that it does say consolidated, so this would include any entities you control if you are uh, a rather a bigger entity and you have entities that you do control. Uh, another interesting point here is if you are a controlling corporation and you report under the Angus Act, um, there are separate requirements or separate criteria for you. So um, if you are registered under the Corporations Act as a controlling corporation um, and you are reporting to Angers, I, I believe you should know who you are if you do, um, and you meet the publication threshold, you would be in the first group. So the publication threshold we've just uh, indicated on the screen there, but that relates to um, your scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and if you exceed that, then you would report to Angers. 
Um, by the end of the transition period in Group 3, this would be for all controlling corporations. And all of these years that you see on the screen here refer to financial years. Um, so if we move on then, we've just looked at who it applies to and the general timeframes that it might apply by. Next, we will zoom in a little bit more into the what. And in order to do that, we will focus on the ISSB. And uh, there are a few reasons for that, but uh, one is that the, double I, the AASB have made it quite clear and Treasury have made it quite clear that um, their intention is to align as far as is practically possible to the IASB. And uh, the, it is also really regarded as the new global gold standard. Um, the TCFD report that was released just last week will in fact be its last status update report because it's already transferred its monitoring responsibilities over to the IFRS, which oversees the ISSB. So um, the ISSB is really set to be the new global standard, but why? So on the next slide, uh, we'll see that it consolidates and draws upon a whole bunch of existing climate reporting standards. And the intention of the ISSB was really to streamline all of these as much as possible so that companies can streamline their reporting and hopefully it can save you time as well. At the same time, improve comparability internationally while providing investors with still decision useful information. So hopefully um, maybe a lot of the, um, the acronyms on the page might be familiar to you. So GRI, CDP, SASB, Integrated Reporting, and of course the TCFD. And hopefully it will be welcomed as well um, because hopefully that will be less reporting for you. Um, another point to note here is that the ISSB is voluntary. So it only becomes mandatory insofar as jurisdictions adopt them. And um, how they adopt them or the extent to which they adopt them is up to the jurisdictions. So we'll see how this plays out in the Australian context shortly. Um, of course, if you do want to be a leader and align with the ISSB voluntarily, that is of course open for you to do. Uh, quick question then, does that mean the TCFD will become defunct? I, I mentioned the body itself will become disbanded, but in terms of the actual framework, no, it still lives on. So um, on the next slide, um, you will see the overall structure of the ISSB standards, which is um, the overall structure is four pillars, as you'll see on the screen. And this is almost identical to the TCFD because it drew very heavily upon the TCFD when it was being developed. So uh, starting with governance, this is about what processes, uh, controls and procedures you have in place for your board and your management to monitor, manage and oversee climate related risks and opportunities. So um, this includes not just the board and management, but ideally your working groups and your subcommittees sitting below that so that it's clear in your disclosure how climate related information flows up to the decision makers at the top and how they are making strategic decisions um, considering the information that they're getting from everyone else. Next is the strategy pillar. So this is around current and potential impacts of climate change over the short, medium and long term and hopefully using climate scenario analysis. So what are the impacts on your organization's business, your strategy and your financial planning um, what are the uh, climate risks and opportunities that you've identified and hopefully assessed using climate scenario analysis? Now, this is the recommendation and the pillar that companies seem to struggle the most with, particularly um, the last one around business resilience, around the use of scenario analysis. Only 11% of companies assessed in the latest TCFD status update report actually disclosed on it. So companies are really struggling um, with this one. So a, a little bit of context here as well for those who uh, aren't too familiar. What is climate scenario analysis and what is a scenario? So to start off with um, a scenario, it is a hypothetical future um, that is aligned with a certain temperature outcome. So um, for example, in a high transition risk scenario, we might be uh, looking at 
um, what does the world look like if it wants to align with a 1.5 degree warming world where every everyone tries to decarbonize as quickly as they can. In On the other end of the extreme, you might consider a high physical impact scenario where um, we don't do much to decarbonize and we continue warming to four degrees or more. So usually climate scenarios would look at these two extremes to see um, what is the potential range of outcomes um, my company might consider and this overall helps you understand how resilient is my company to uh, physical climate change risks, so heat waves, flooding, sea level rise, uh, as well as transition risks and opportunities in the future. So um, this would be anything that arises from the transition to a low carbon economy, be it policy change, uh, shifting consumer preferences, litigation risk, reputation risk, all of those. Um, so that's the second pillar, uh, the strategy, which is where you should be disclosing what, so what are your climate risks and opportunities and how um, exposed you are. In comparison, the third pillar, risk management, should be about the how. So what are the processes you've used to identify, assess, prioritize and monitor your climate related risks and opportunities. And this also includes um, whether and how these processes are integrated into your overall enterprise risk management or ERM processes. Uh, it's important because climate related processes should be integrated and um, not really treated in silo for um, continued uh, proper management of them. And finally, the fourth pillar, metrics and targets. This is around your company's performance in relation to climate related risks and opportunities. So it should include um, any metrics that you've set and therefore that will help you track your progress against those. And of course, any climate related targets that you've set. A key thing to call out here is that it includes greenhouse gas emissions, but it is also more than this. There are climate related risks and opportunities beyond emissions. So that's the overall uh, structure of the ISSB and the TCFD. If we go to the next slide, we dive just one layer deeper and explore uh, where the ISSB might build on or um, make explicit TCFD, make TCFD recommendations more explicit. So um, for example, in the strategy pillar, there is an expectation that you disclose quantified financial impacts of climate risks and opportunities. And so this is where you need to be able to disclose how um, physical or climate risks and opportunities impact your financial position, financial performance or your cash flow. So basically your, your financial statements um, in your annual reports. So this could be um, impacts in terms of a range or a single amount uh, in terms of financial terms. And um, this is more of a reinforcement of the TCFD's exists, existing uh, expectations. And um, additionally, the ISSB uh, requires that entities disclose the amount or percentage of assets or business activities that are vulnerable to uh, physical and transition risks um, or assets and um, business activities that are aligned with climate related opportunities. Another key uh, call out is that in the ISSB there is a greater focus on climate transition plans, which is a pretty new topic in the uh, climate world. Um, basically, reporting entities must outline how they plan to transition to a low carbon economy and achieve any climate targets that they've set. So these plans should include uh, any current and anticipated changes to your business model, your strategy, your resource allocation or your capital alloc allocation as a result of uh, the results from your climate scenario analysis, which should tell you how exposed or how vulnerable you are to certain climate change risks and opportunities and which ones are the most material ones that you should focus on. Um, another area where the ISSB uh, goes further or differs from the TCFD is in the risk management pillar. So the TCFD focused specifically on climate risk. The ISSB now expands this to include climate opportunities. So disclosing you on your processes to identify, assess and manage those two. Um, there is also an expectation to share more detail around the extent and the nature of integrating those climate uh, processes into your ERM processes. 
Um, and then a, a couple of other points to call out here is in the metrics and targets pillar, specifically on scope three, which are your indirect emissions up and down your supply chain. So the ISSB does require disclosure of scope three emissions in addition to your scope one and two. In the TCFD, this was previously encouraged if you had deemed a scope three category to be material, but it wasn't explicitly made mandatory. The ISSB makes this mandatory. Um, additionally, financed emissions, which is uh, category 15 of scope three, must also be disclosed by entities involved in asset management, commercial banking or insurance. So basically most financial institutions need to disclose their financed emissions under the ISSB. Um, the Australian requirements uh, require material scope three categories at this stage, but again, we, we should wait for the, the draft standards to be formally issued. Um, finally, here, scope two emissions, so um, the ones that relate to your electricity use. Um, the ISSB requires a location-based approach. So again, for, uh, for those who aren't super familiar, um, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol outlines two methods for calculating your scope two emissions. One is a location-based approach, which reflects the average emissions intensity in your grids while a market-based approach reflects emissions from electricity that you might have procured, so maybe through contractual instruments or renewable energy certificates. So the ISSB requires location-based. Um, interestingly, um, last week's AASB board minutes indicated that they were um, leaning more towards the other approach. So um, in short, what this means for entities, it's probably safest to report both location-based and market-based scope two emissions, especially if you're looking to be both a leader um, and comply with both Australian requirements and the IWSB. So I know that was a lot. Um, to If we go to the next slide and just to close the loop coming back to the Australian requirements, um, a final point of difference with the ISSB is that the Australian requirements actually mandate your disclosures to be assured, whereas the ISSB do not explicitly require that. So there are varying levels of assurance that will be phased in, as you see on the page here, um, starting with limited assurance for some aspects and then slowly moving to reasonable assurance um, later on. And you'll see on the page there some specific recommendations that these different levels of assurance pertain to. By the end of the transition period, the expectation is that disclosures would meet a reasonable assurance threshold. And of course, if you're in one of the later groups, uh, then all of these dates in the second row should be shifted back accordingly. Um, but I appreciate this is a lot of information to get your head around. And I guess the, the big question for you is also next, what happens if you don't comply with all of this? And the official stance from the consultation paper is that um, regulators only can take action. Uh, it is possible against directors and the reporting entities itself, and specifically in relation to any forward-looking statements and scope three emissions during the three-year transitional period. So whilst this might be of some concern to you, um, at the same time, in practice, um, there are certain uh, protections built into the Corporations Act for entities and company offices. So, for example, where you can demonstrate that you've acted honestly and ought to fairly uh, be excused for any breaches, um, this might help protect you. And, of course, regulators um, will exercise their discretion when they are pursuing any uh, breaches. So, maybe maybe it just might be issuing infringement notices. Who knows, it is sort of in the hands of regulators. So um, that's all we know at the moment. But to summarize, we've just looked at the climate risk disclosure landscape globally in the Asia Pacific region and zoomed in on the Australian requirements coming up, including the who, the when, the what, and we touched on the related ISSB standards, that would be um, the global, the new global baseline, um, and areas where the Australian requirements might uh, mirror or depart slightly from those standards. 
And all of that might be somewhat daunting for you, depending on where you might be on your climate journey. And your next question might be, how do I prepare? Well, we at South Pole have worked with clients at varying levels of maturity and through it, we have developed various solutions that are tailored and can support our clients wherever they are in their journey. So that's why now I'll hand it over to Sonia to talk more about these. Thank you so much, Nancy. And as Nancy has said, a question you probably have at this point is, how do I prepare? Now, the answer to that question is very dependent on your organization's maturity, complexity, and level of ambition. But there are some general next steps that you can take that should be broadly applicable to almost everyone on this call. The first thing we recommend is for you to really take stock. So assess what all of your current reporting obligations are. And this is both under compliance or mandatory schemes, as well as any voluntary reporting you do. And as part of that, you also want to be identifying the data that you're using, as well as who is responsible across your organization. The reason for this is you can start to try and identify areas of overlap or inefficiencies. And this first step of assessing what you actually do is really important because it provides the basis for the gap analysis between what you currently do and what you might be required to do under Australia's mandatory reporting requirements. And again, we emphasize that during this stage, you want to be looking for perhaps situations where different departments in your organization are using the same data, but reporting it in different ways to different schemes and how that can be consolidated. Or you might have the inverse scenario where you have one person responsible for reporting against multiple schemes, but getting the data for each scheme from different places in the organization. And this provides an opportunity to try and come up with ways around these inefficiencies. Ultimately, though, what you're looking for is a plan. So a way to close the gap between what you currently do and what you may need to do. So an example is you may say, well, we already do robust reporting of our scope one, two and three greenhouse gas emissions. But the next step is we need to set an emissions reduction target. So that topic, that title, set emissions reduction topic or target, then becomes a key step on your multi-month pathway to full compliance. And this can help you take all this jumble of, I don't know what to do, there's climate risk, there's greenhouse gas reporting, there's targets, and actually lay it out in a linear fashion, which also helps you understand who in your organization you may be reaching out to for support along the way. I think what's really important for us to emphasize is that this exercise is not just to identify what you need to do to report, but it's also going to feed into your broader sustainability and climate strategy. Throughout this process, you want to be doing this review of your data systems and internal systems. This space is not going to get less complex. And so making sure you have good foundations in place to support new and increasingly complex requirements will only serve to make this journey easier for you. Along the way, as Nancy alluded to, make sure that you're transparently communicating progress, what you intend to do next, and how that action plan will help set you up for full compliance. And of course, this is a dynamic time, not only in Australia, but globally. So you need to make sure you're keeping an eye out on the continuously evolving requirements for reporting, but also your broader strategy. Now, if we go to the next slide, please, Alex, the reason I keep emphasizing this connection between reporting and your broader strategy is because it's important to see the ISSB, the ASSB requirements, all of them as not standalone, but really part of your broader climate journey. So on the screen here, we have what South Pole calls the climate journey. And the first step is to measure and understand. So this is measuring your greenhouse gas emissions and understanding your climate risks and opportunities. The next step, once you know where you are, is to identify where you want to be. So setting targets and then creating a roadmap that connects the two. And these two steps of measuring and setting targets are very fundamentally aligned with what the mandatory reporting requirements are asking you to disclose under the four pillars that Nancy alluded to. But it's really important to also understand that it doesn't stop there. It's not a checkbox exercise of setting a target and reporting it. These steps are in place to allow you to enact tangible change. So you should be using this information to take greenhouse gas mitigation steps and reduce your footprint, fund climate action, through, for example, beyond uh, value chain mitigation actions and continuously communicating and leading. 
So on the next few slides, I'll step through three examples of gaps that you may come up against or tasks you may find you need to do in your organization. I'll give you some quick pointers on questions you need to be asking to take on these steps and also demonstrate how Southwell could potentially support. And then we'll go straight into key takeaways in Q&A. So on the next slide, Alex, we talk about greenhouse gas reporting. Greenhouse gas accounting is foundational. You really need to understand your greenhouse gas footprint to make sure you can report on all relevant emissions categories. And for most of us on this call, this means we cannot ignore scope three emissions. And when you're busy calculating your scope three emissions, key questions to ask is, are we using robust internationally accepted frameworks like the greenhouse gas protocol? How are we aligning to frameworks like ANGA, if that's applicable? And then when you do have your footprint, that it's not just a set of numbers for reporting, but it can really help your business with key insights. For example, where are your emissions hotspots, which facilities, which geographies? And then presenting this in a visual way that can help you communicate both internally and externally. So on the screen, we have some examples from some of South Pole's reporting. And yeah, I want to emphasize that this can either be a very complex process if you are a very complex company in a complex sector, but South Pole also has tools to support companies that may be in less complex sectors, develop their greenhouse gas footprints in a quick and easy way to get this answer in only a matter of a few weeks. On the next slide, we look at the next step, which is target setting and developing a greenhouse gas um, or a emissions reduction roadmap. So yeah, key things you wanna take note of asking is which framework is applicable to my company? Of course, we wanna be aligned with 1.5 degrees. So you wanna be looking at frameworks like the science-based target initiative, but you also need to be asking what other frameworks are applicable to my sector and what are my peers doing? Then you need to make sure you're assessing the key criteria within your company. What is our scope? What is our ambition? What is our coverage before setting the targets? And once you've set the target, developing this roadmap for emissions reductions, your company may even choose to then take the final step, which is getting this validated under framework like the SPTI. Again, for very complex uh, organizations in complex sectors, where you also have different facilities with unique emission reduction opportunities, this can be a time consuming process and it can take several months and we can absolutely support companies with this, but we also have tools that can enable certain companies and sectors that are perhaps less complex or where the emission reduction opportunities are more well known to be able to get these answers much faster. The last example I'll go through is in climate risk. And as Nancy has shared, there are several steps in identifying both your physical and transition climate risks and opportunities, assessing them, quantifying them, so working on what the financial impact is, and then most importantly, developing that business strategy to build resilience in your organization. A key aspect I wanna call out here yeah, is a very unique tool and offering that Southall can provide, particularly for physical climate risks, where using inputs on your geographies and key locations of your key facilities or assets, we can put this into our tool and rapidly give you insights presented in a very visual way of how your assets might be exposed to physical risks like extreme weather events, rainfall, or heat stress. And so this can be a quick way to get started and already be able to start identifying those physical climate related risks for your company. So just three examples, but of course there could be a myriad of actions that come out. So on the next slide, a few more we've spoken about is potentially you have already identified your roadmap for emissions reductions. You know that a lot of that sits in transitioning to renewable electricity, but you're not sure what the best options are in terms of EPAs, LGCs, or even on-site RE solutions. You could be in a unique sector like agriculture, and here you're looking for specific solutions, for example, around insetting, or potentially your impact sits more in something like plastics instead of greenhouse gas emissions directly. All of this is just to say that developing that action plan is how you will identify these particular steps, put them in a linear order that makes sense so you're building upon the lessons from the next step. And of course, these are all steps that Southpaw can support with both in um, an engaged bespoke process where we work with you over several months or leveraging some of our tools which we have for all of the um, examples you can see on the slide where we can do a quick start solution for you and help you get answers quicker. That all being said, 
the key takeaways from today. So our three main takeaways is climate related reports will soon be mandated. Of course, we know this and that's why you joined the webinar today. But the point we want to emphasize is this is not several years away. This is happening now and the first group of entities will be affected in the FY24-25 financial year with a cascading to other entities. Second key takeaway is that the ISFB draws upon and consolidates existing standards. So really becoming this overarching framework aiming to simplify reporting requirements. The TCFD has significantly influenced the ISSB. So if you have already done work under the TCFD, this is still very valuable and will support your disclosures going forward. But it's important to note that the ISSB does go further and call for more detailed disclosure in some aspects. And we will soon be able to see how this will translate into the Australian regulatory framework once this is announced for consultation. And lastly, the time to start preparing is now. So regardless of where you land on the timeline that Nancy shared and when mandatory reporting will become directly applicable to your company, understanding what you may need to do, the gaps in what you currently do, and starting to actually take those actions will take time. So we highly recommend that at least the first step of understanding what you need to do and starting to put in the preparatory work is something that everyone on this call starts as soon as possible. With that said, I'll hand over to Alex to take us through the last sections of today. Thanks so much, Sonia and Nancy. So before we move on to the Q&A, and I encourage you now, if you haven't already, I can see some questions coming through, but please do put your questions in the question box. Uh, and I know there are a lot of uh, South Pole clients joining uh, on the call today, but for those who are perhaps not as familiar with South Pole, uh, we uh, have been in the climate space for 17 years uh, and started as a carbon project developer, but today we are a full service uh, climate consultancy helping clients uh, right across their climate journeys all the way through to communicating their action. Uh, and we're right across the world. We were founded in Switzerland and still headquartered there. Uh, and in Australia, we have offices in Sydney and Melbourne. So moving on uh, to the questions, and I'll invite Sonia and Nancy to um, turn their cameras back on so we can see them and I can see the questions coming through. So uh, perhaps this first one for Nancy, do we need to create separate reports for each subsidiary or only report at the company level? Great question, this one. Um, so we have to read in between the lines here a bit because the um, consultation paper doesn't explicitly go into this in detail. And of course, we're still waiting for the AASB um, standards. So if we read between the lines and look at the thresholds um, for the size criteria, they do talk about consolidated asset values and um, revenue. So it sort of implies that you should also cover any subsidiaries that you include in your normal consolidated figures. So the next point is I think we need to remember there is doing the actual back end of the work. So in order for something to actually report on, this might be, for example, doing the actual scenario analysis if you haven't actually done any. Um, and practically speaking, some of that may be done together across all subsidiaries and some of it might need to be more phased in. Um, depending on what level of resources you have uh, in your company and what your priorities are. But once you've done the back end work and you're thinking about whether or not to report separately or altogether, um, we would probably suggest both depending on the purpose of the reports and your intended disclosure strategy. So for example, what uh, goes into your annual report and your financial uh, filings versus your sustainability report versus a standalone um, TCFD or ISSB report and for which entities um, would you do this for? So we do help our clients walk through these when we deliver our work. Um, but it, but I would imagine as well for each of your subsidiaries, there will be stakeholders who are interested in knowing um, the information for that specific subsidiary. So it might still be worth to do separate reports too. But the bottom line is um, that's reading in between the lines and we just need to wait a bit more until the detailed standards are developed and we'll hopefully cover uh, some of these more detailed questions. Thanks very much, Nancy. Uh, another one for you. 
when you are a global company that triggers, say, Group 1, does your disclosure only have to cover your Australian operations or does it need to cover global operations? So I, I would say a similar answer here um, that we don't have the full detail yet, but I would say it's safe to assume that it should cover um, any global operations for which you have control over. Um, if you normally count them uh, in your consolidated figures, then I would suggest you should cover that uh, just in case. And some of the activities, like I mentioned, you would be doing uh, t together anyway. So for example, um, looking at physical risks, uh, these are quite geography dependent. So um, it might make sense for uh, you to just analyze them all together um, in a single climate risk assessment. Great, thank you. And for Sonia, what if we have all the data required but have never written a report before? Yeah, very good question. I mean, I'd start by saying collecting all the data is already the big step, which you should feel uh, proud about. However, of course, the requirement for this is to actually then take the next step and disclose it. So I would say as you're translating the data into the narrative, there's always two questions that we recommend you keep in mind. The first is, what is the key insight that a company or somebody reading this would want, to walk, want them to walk away with? So making sure that you're not just transferring numbers for numbers sake, but providing insights. And the second one is to provide enough context or supporting information. So that somebody who is not perhaps intimately uh, acquainted with all of the acronyms, and underlying details in the ISSB and TCFD framework still have enough to enable those keywords, decision, useful insights. Um, of course, this is something that a company like South Pole can help with to draft those disclosures or review once you've drafted them yourself. Thanks, Sonia. Um, all right, and back to Nancy. Is mandatory reporting coverage also conditional on the organisation having obligations under 2M of the Corporations Act? The short answer would be yes. So um, the requirement applies to all entities that meet prescribed size thresholds and that are required to lodge financial reports under Chapter 2M of the Corporations Act. So um, the requirement is expecting the disclosures to come through in your annual reports. Thank you. Just organising my next questions here. Um, then one for Nancy again. How often do companies need to refresh, redo their scenario analysis and scenario planning? This is a good one, we get this a lot. Um, the answer is that it depends. Um, so it depends firstly on what risk we're talking about. So uh, for example, physical risk databases, uh, especially ones that come through the IPCC um, using data sets, which are global, standard, uh, global gold standard, these are released um, probably every five to seven years and that's just because it's a huge extensive academic process um, where all the client si climate scientists get together and they um, agree on, on these data sets. So um, considering that uh, climate physical risks aren't expected to really intensify until the latter half of the century combined with the pace at which new information might be released it's a little safer to do to refresh your physical risk assessments um, less often than you might need to do it for transition risks. So transition risks, um, the nature of it is that um, it arises if there's a lot of um, movement towards a low carbon economy, uh, whether it's policy change or consumer change, et cetera. So, that implies already, um, especially considering the, the climate or the environment that we're operating in now, we're seeing lots of momentum there. I would expect more transition risks um, or opportunities uh, to change more rapidly. And uh, one leading source that we often use for transition risk assessments comes from the IEA, so the International Energy Agency. There's a lot of data coming from them and um, they release annually um, their 
world energy outlook. So considering that there's new information coming out yearly um, and the pace at which transition risks would change, then um, it probably makes sense to do that more frequently than for physical risks. Um, the other overall consideration would be uh, how much your organisation is changing. So, for example, if in your initial assessment um, you covered all of your assets in Australia, but you've recently acquired some in New Zealand or elsewhere, um, then it might make sense for you to refresh it uh, to include those extra assets. Um, or if you've aligned with a certain climate scenario and you now want to consider a different climate scenario. So there's different ways in which you can phase it, and especially for the organisations that are particularly big. Uh, it is a huge exercise to try and cover absolutely everything in the first year. So some companies um, might take more of a filtering or prioritisation approach to first tackle the most material areas of your business and the most material risks and opportunities before in future years uh, looking at other ones. Once you're happy that you have a some sort of plan or um, adaptation and mitigation measures in place for your most material ones, for your most material parts of your business. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, and back to Sonia for the next question. Does this new reporting mean we need to redo our greenhouse gas accounting, even if we did it already this year? Right, so no, not necessarily. I mean, best practice, you should be doing your greenhouse gas accounting every year anyway. Um, and the need to redo it would really depend on how well you already understand and the extent of coverage of your greenhouse gas reporting. So, for example, are you currently only reporting and measuring your scope one and two emissions to comply with something like anger? Um, or do you also understand and report on your full scope three emissions? The new requirements under the ISSB absolutely do mean that you would need to understand your scope three, so value chain emissions, at least starting with those material categories. So that would mean you do a high level screening of all of the applicable scope three greenhouse gas emissions categories, identify your material scope three categories, and then making sure that you disclose these from the second reporting year onwards. So there is a temporary one-year exemption, which is why we say from the second reporting year onwards. And this exemption is, of course, an acknowledgement that there is a lot of complexity around Scope 3, so it's to allow companies to develop that expertise and capability to build up Scope 3. And then lastly, what does that mean, or what does it all mean under the Australian reporting requirements? Well, we'll have to see how much the finalised Australian requirements actually mirror what we currently see in the ISSB. Um, particularly things around uh, which, whether we use location-based or market-based reporting for scope two and how that aligns with other schemes we have in Australia, example like ANGER, uh, current best practice, even under frameworks like the SPTI, as Nancy already mentioned, is to report both location and market-based, but we'd have to see how much the Australian um, standards mirror what is currently in the ISSB. Great, thanks, Sonia. Um, and then another one for Nancy. If a company does a risk assessment internally, would it satisfy ISSB disclosure requirements or does it have to be done by an independent consultant or third party? Also another good question. I think it really comes down to the risk assessment that has been done internally and how robust it is and how in line uh, with best practice it is um, how, and how confident you are internally that it um, meets that standard. So I think it is probably a safer bet to uh, engage an external consultant. If not to do it, then at least to review the work that you've done and uh, provide an opinion on um, how well it's been done. Thank you. And another question for Nancy. Within my company, who should be taking on the role of doing the reporting? So there's no hard and fast rule about who should be taking on this role of reporting. Amongst our clients, we have seen it sit within finance teams, risk teams, sustainability teams, or even legal teams. 
the overarching comment I think that we would make is that you do need to gather inputs from cross-functional stakeholders to make it happen and it shouldn't be done in silos. Um, it would still be wise to have a dedicated function that leads it wherever this is. The finance team is obviously a critical function because the ultimate aim of the disclosure uh, requirements is to integrate the climate related information into its uh, financial filings or statements. But the issue is that finance teams do not traditionally have the skill sets required to conduct climate scenario analysis in line with best practices. And once you've done that to interpret the results from it and then to draft these in a digestible and easy to understand manner for investors or stakeholders. So, I mean, that's why companies and teams like us exist. That's why we have a job. Um, it's, for example, scenario analysis is something that we take months to do. Um, working with a very uh, cross-functional team, we have climate scientists, um, strategy consultants, engineers, financial experts, lawyers, uh, ex-internal auditors on the team so that we can come together and bring a really balanced view for our clients. Thanks very much, Nancy, and thanks, Sonia. I think we will wrap the questions there. There were a few other questions uh, submitted and we will get back to those questions uh, via email following uh, the end of the webinar. Um, but just to wrap up, we do have a post-webinar survey which uh, you can access via the QR code which is on the screen at the moment. It will also be included uh, in the email following the end of the webinar. Um, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for joining. Uh, if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we would love to hear from you and enjoy the rest of your day.